Money from Tonys and Oscars and Emmys and Grammys. There's no red carpet because they're home in their jammies. From Melrose Place to Broadway to Janeway and her crew. Let Seth and James bring all the stars to you. Anywho. They're entertaining everyone, so who's gonna grouse? Just sit right back and you'll hear some tales on Star. Hello, Hi. everyone. Happy Earth Day. I'm yes. Seth Udesky. This is James Wesley. This is Stars in the House. We are celebrating Earth Day. I'm going to make sure I have this clearly by raising money for the Water Keeper Alliance with the cast of What ER. This show is called Stars in the House. We began when everything shut down last March. We were raising money for the Actress Fund, which is for everybody in the arts. So you can be on stage, backstage, in front of the cameras, right. behind the cameras. We've raised almost around $900,000 at this point from viewers like you. But today we are dedicating to Water Keeper Alliance. Before we forget, we have so many viewers tonight. We want you, please, God, all to subscribe to the channel because the more viewers we get, the more we can have amazing reunions like ER. And we've had Grey's Anatomy. We want to keep them coming. So subscribe so we look super fancy. Right. right. Subscribe starts. There you go. Right there. David has it. Starts in the house. Thank you. Um, in fact, at the end of the show, um, BB Newworth and Brian Stokes Mitchell and Chandra Wilson, speaking of Grey's Anatomy, um, and Annette Benning all made this great video, but we're going to show it at the end of the show. We're going to get to ER. Right. So and and we're going to get to Gloria Rubin, who put this whole thing together, who not only Gina Boulay, but also the president of Waterkeeper Alliance in her spare time. She's like, yeah, she's got spare time. She's going to be the president of Waterkeeper Alliance, bringing clean water to everyone around the world. But she's going to be on in a couple of minutes to talk more about that. And the way that tonight is going to work is there are so many people who said yes. They're going to be kind of coming on in waves like a party. So there's just yeah. going to be that's how it's going to roll. So don't tonight. spend your time in the comments going, oh, like, my where God, is, where is right? They're going to be here. They're so going to. It's just going to kind of happen. Yeah. Um, and and right now, what we've always had uh, before we get to Dr. Ross and and Nurse Hathaway and Dr. Green and Dr. Hicks and everyone else, we have our own medical we expert, have an actual medical expert. Right. Let's a, be honest. A doc, a, a real doctor, even though he is also a doctor on TV because he's the chief medical correspondent of CBS News. He's been here since our very first show. He gives us major up-to-the-date COVID updates. Please welcome Dr. John LaBook. Hey, guys. Now, I know I time is limited. I promised you a spiel in 90 seconds, and here's the spiel because we have so many new viewers. Okay, where are we right now? Tony Fauci says we need herd immunity to be about, what, 75, 80% of people to get the vaccine. There's 20% of people by the latest polls say they're not getting it or they're not going to get it unless it's mandated, okay? That leaves 80%. We got to get the rest. At the beginning in December, 39% of people said they were going to be waiting and seeing. That's gone way down to 17%. It's that 17% of people we've got to get. So how do we do that? First thing we do is we listen to what the questions are. Why, why is there hesitancy? And there are a couple of things out there. One of them is it's happened too fast. It was Operation Warp Speed and it couldn't be safe. Well, it turns out that the technology that this was based on is decades old. So it wasn't done overnight. It was done over decades. Second of all, they're saying, well, wait a second, the Johnson & Johnson, you know, it's causing some clots. You know, isn't that a worrisome? Yeah, it is worrisome. Guess what? That's like about a one in a million side effect. And, and the whole screening procedure uh, and regimen picked that up. That should make people feel good. Same thing with the manufacturing problems they had uh, at the factory where they picked that up because they, not one of those shots got out into anybody's arm. So there's a lot of, you know, belt and suspenders that are working here. And I think, you know, we've got a lot of movers and shakers out there. I Could you imagine some PSAs from the people out here saying to people, hey, we're, we're almost doctors. We're real live almost doctors. Uh, and, uh, you know, here are the reasons why you should take the vaccine. So that's 90 seconds and I'm out of here. All right, Dr. Dr. Pook, Pook, you're the best. Get a vaccine, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Pook. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. That's right. And if I don't, and if I forget, Billy Davis Jr. and Marilyn McCoo are going to be here tomorrow. When the moon that's right. Fifth is dimension. In the seventh house. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and then on Saturday, uh, game night with uh, Our favorites. That's right. Uh, the first standing on Broadway, Andrew McArdle and Mandy Gonzalez from In the Heights. That's In the Heights and Wicked and Hamilton. Yeah. That's Saturday so night. That's but Saturday let's night. focus on E. That's right. And and where should we start? We need to start with the woman who made this happen. This is Gloria Rubin. Gloria, <laughs> Gloria, Gloria. <laughs> I love it when you sing my name. <laughs> <laughs> hey, fellas. Happy Hi, day. Gloria. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for doing this. We we want to tell everybody what is, but not in our words, what is Waterkeeper Alliance? Give us an actual description yeah. of it. 
it is an extraordinary organization. You know, I've been involved with it for about 15 years. I was on the board of trustees quite a few years ago. And as you mentioned, I recently became president of Waterkeeper Alliance last November, November of 2020. So, um, which is kind of amazing, you know, someone else became president in November. Of 2020. <laughs> We're kind of in good company. You know I mean? <laughs> yes, exactly. So Waterkeeper Alliance is a global nonprofit that is focused solely on clean water. And we have over 350 water keepers around the globe, right? Wow. So you're going to ask, what is a water keeper? A water keeper is a person who is who's based in their community, who lives in their community, is a clean water advocate for their community. So they fight for clean water for the people in their community. And in turn, that's what ends up happening for around the globe, is we have these clean water warriors around the globe. They fight in these ways. They patrol and protect their waterways. They, they hunt down um, polluters, they mm. find forces with other environmental organizations, they engage the community to participate in the processes of, you know, solutions, let them learn about what's actually happening in the local watersheds. And one of my favorite things is that they bring polluters to justice. Mm. So they take them to court, they enforce environmental law. And to wow. me, that's what a warrior is. Now, Yes. Right, exactly. So whether it be from manufacturing or mining or factory farming or energy production or sewage waste or human waste or what have you, water keepers literally fight day and night. This is what they do every day for their communities. It's extraordinary. And 350 around the globe. I'm not kidding. So literally like from Peru to the Pacific Northwest, from China to Canada. Gloria, uh, once, Gloria, once Israel, we are everywhere. We are everywhere. You pollute the waterways, we're going to find you and we're going to take you to court. <laughs> I didn't do anything. Oh. I was going to say, Gloria, once everything opens, your passport is going to be filled. I'm telling oh. you, I cannot wait because I've been meeting as many of our water keepers as possible, virtually, obviously, in the regional calls. And so, you know, as we, as Water Keeper Alliance helps strengthen and grow the movement, you know, we offer tangible tools for the individual water keeper groups to become stronger and sustainable themselves. So I have been going, hopping on all of these regional calls. So I get to put faces to names and I get to hear stories from them directly about what they're fighting for and how they're fighting for clean water for their communities. And you guys trust me on this. I mean, when people, I, I just encourage everyone to obviously donate. You can see the scroll on the bottom, but also go to waterkeeper.org and find out who your local water keeper, it is, water keeper is, as well as ones across the globe. Because there are people, water keepers, who are literally putting their lives on the line. Wow. To fight for clean water for their communities. They get bullied by polluters and by politicians. So what I want to do is raise the awareness and the global visibility of Waterkeeper Alliance so that not just the Waterkeeper knows that they are not fighting on their own, but any bully that is, you know, threatening one of my Waterkeepers. You have their back. I feel about it. We have their back and they're my Waterkeeper. I mean, I feel that protective of them. They are fighting for clean water for the communities and we are fighting for them. Yeah. That's amazing. If you read that book, it's you know a civil action. It's about the water being polluted. I've seen that movie, it polluted and it caused all that cancer. I mean, it would be amazing if you guys had helped all the way back then. Well, I I'm telling you, it's just this is again. This is we are in a whole new venture. Especially, I don't know what's happened. Well, I do know what's happened. Of course, everything has shifted in the last few months for sure. But hope is on the horizon. And mm. as I get to see and hear each water keeper, and I feel their passion for what they're doing. And I see their dedication and their commitment and their inspiration. I'm like, you know what? It just feeds my own. I'm a passionate mm. person to begin with, you guys. I am a passionate person. And I don't take things on unless I'm willing to fight for them. Not unless I'm willing to dive deep, no pun intended. And for this organization, <laughs> the water keepers, I I just they are they are amazing. They are amazing people. So they Gloria, are. tell everyone how they can join you. In, in having everyone's back around the world who's fighting for clean water. Indeed. Well, today, of course, we're all about raising funds for uh, Waterkeeper Alliance and, and, and Waterkeeper Alliance is matching donations up to 25,000 through tonight, maybe even extending that over the weekend, depending how well we do tonight on Earth Day. But absolutely sign up, go to waterkeeper.org, sign up for the newsletters. You can find your local waterkeeper. You could actually be on the ground, hopefully in person soon, to find out what's going on in your local watershed mm -hmm. or in the nearby water keeper or go around the globe. Check out what's going on in Nepal. See what's going on in India, right? See what's happening in Australia, in Senegal, as I had mentioned, in Latin America. 
I mean, we are just, I cannot wait to travel to see everybody in person. I, I, I just, and I'm acting as well. I have some good stuff coming up. And, you know, I'm writing my, and music, I mean, I don't know what I, I'm just a crazy person. I just, <laughs> and you organize all these people. Everybody, yes. I mean, I know. You, I said yes. I can't wait. I've been so excited. It was okay, so we're going to start, but, but, uh, but uh, the QR code was just up. We're going to, David is going to bring it up a couple of times throughout the show. If not, uh, there you go. Um, if not, as you can see it scrolling on the bottom, it'll be there the entire show. Join and make a donation. We'd love to raise some That's right, money, man. That's the matching. That's amazing. I know. Well, thanks again for doing this for Waterkeeper Alliance. I really, I mean, thanks for saying yes to this, especially on Earth Day. I mean, literally, every day is Earth Day. Where would we be without clean water to drink? All right, Gloria, oh. let's do this. Let's do it. Yes. yes. So, water. That's right. <laughs> Champagne. Water, water. Cheers. Well, not water. I have a feeling that George Clooney does not have water, but we'll we can ask him. He's staying up quite late. A, That's right. <laughs> He's in London. So let's bring people on. Let's just bring them on. We've got Laura Ennis. Hello, hi Gloria. Hi, oh, hi beauty. Oh my god, so good to see you. You too. Thanks for doing this. It's amazing. Oh my gosh, thanks for joining us. Oh my goodness. We've got wow. CCH Pounder. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hey, Gloria. What's up? Hi, honey. <laughs> How are you doing? Hey, Beauty. I'm just great. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. How are you? I'm great. And I, oh, let me just toast you with some water. <laughs> <laughs> you? Water keeper. We've got Anthony Edwards. Yeah. Hey, Gloria. <laughs> Hi! Wow! So wow! Good to see you. It's so you, good. Like just hearing your intro, I'm like, that's it. That's done. Someone's <laughs> doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing, and I'm so proud to 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 know you. Yeah. Yeah. And wow! Congratulations on being president. Thank God, our first female <laughs> president. I knew it would be you all along. <laughs> and uh, in in protest, I'm not even going to drink any water tonight. I'm going to save it for other people. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's please Hi, Laura. Hi, welcome. Hi, Tony. <laughs> Juliana Margulies. Hi, Hi, guys. Hello. Oh, my Hi. God. It's so good to see you all. Oh, my gosh. Jules, how are you? Hi, I'm good. I'm in LA Hi. in a rental. Oh, you are? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You all look like you're all cozy and at home. And I'm like, well, I'm in a rental. You've got well, white walls and stainless steel appliances yeah. behind you. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's quite sophisticated. Yes. Thanks um, for joining, Jules. It's so good to see you all. And no, thank you, Gloria. I'm so impressed. I'm really <laughs> impressed. And I'm thrilled. And I've been on some of these Waterkeeper Alliance trips in Banff that we used to take years ago. Exactly. Well, more than that. So, so I've been a big supporter for years, and I can't thank you enough for taking the lead. Well done. Thank you, love. All right, next up is Noah Wiley. Oh, oh my God. Hi, everybody. Gosh, you have just met so Noah Wiley. All day to see you all. Oh, my, oh my God. God. I miss you all terribly. <laughs> Thanks for organizing this, Gloria. Welcome. See you. And even though it's 1 10 a.m. where he is, George Clooney. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> hi, guys. Hi, Gloria. Hi, George. Um, hi, gang. Boy, I miss you guys. And what a fun thing to see every one of your faces, man. We, we went through a ride together. Gloria, I want to say... First of all, you know, we always think that these these issues are uh, third world country issues. Flint, Michigan had a lot of problems with their water as well. So it's okay. a it's a very noble thing that you're doing. And and uh, and thank you for that. And we're all very impressed with that. And also, thank you for getting us together, because I have to tell you, I look at these faces and, you know, we all of us share a, a really unique moment in time. All, all of us, we, uh, you know, <laughs> we went from obscurity to um, a very different life almost overnight. And, uh, and Tony was our fear, fearless leader. And it was just an, it was such an exciting thing to be part of and to see all of you guys. And 
and not to see any gray hair, which really pisses me off. <laughs> oh, it's there. If you don't have any, you can't get gray. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I know it's in the middle of the night where you are, so I really, you know, thank you, all of you, for for being here, showing your story. Really, it means a great deal. So, so um, we've we've got a ton of fan questions, and basically all that we've been hearing in our house the last two weeks is the ER theme song because we've, we've been, been watching episode after episode after watching, episode, getting preparing. clips and like, okay, this is a great you one can't for really Gloria. Sing it, can you? It's like, -e -e -e. it doesn't really have a melody. No, it's very 80s. It's very 80s. I kept saying, is this Buffy? It was like, it's like, it's. That's all. My wife, my wife has been watching it. This has been a very, very disastrous thing for me because I forgot all of the all of the terrible things I did as Dr. Ross. And oh, you're a player. You're the I'm worst. a total player. My wife keeps going, are, is that it? Are you done? Uh, season three? Do you finally settle down with uh, Nurse Hathaway? And I'm like, yeah, I, I think so. And it's like, not, not, even, not even close. It's been a disaster for my marriage. Uh, all right, so let's dive right in. This is like, this is a, a really uh, a simple question, and I think I know your answer because, because seeing everyone's reaction here, but here it is. What do you miss the most about this show? That's from a viewer, McFly DeLorean, a fan of Back to the Future, apparently. <laughs> Anyone jump in? I, I miss this. I miss. I miss. Yeah. All right, go ahead, Tony. You start. You start okay, I'm just gonna because I'll yeah, then I'll cry when you speak too. No, <laughs> it was really um, as George said, a special time, and you know, it's one of those things where the sanity and the happiness and the joy was on the set, and all the madness was around. But when you came to work and when you played with all of these wonderful people, we laughed nonstop. I mean, the image I always have is like we were on stage 11 and we were just laughing each other while every, you know, in the show, everybody's dying, everything. And next door at Friends, you go onto that stage and it was like a cemetery. It was like, there was no <laughs> laughing, there was nothing. I'm like, aren't you guys? Like, it was a total reversal. And of course, they were wonderful and doing great and everything. But we just had a, a synergy of people. Uh, and we, I, I've, I've, you know, I feel like I laughed and stayed in love for eight years. So it's, it's all of these people that I love and miss. Oh my gosh, laughing and staying in love for eight years. That's kind of my dream. That's like my romance. <laughs> but that was, don't you love. think that's actually, that was sort of the secret to the whole thing was that, um, I remember when, when we were at the upfronts and people who don't know what the upfronts are, it's when they sort of present the new series for the year. And we hadn't seen anything of our show yet. And we were standing backstage. Juliana wasn't allowed to be there because she was supposed to be dead. Oh. And we were standing backstage, and they showed it, and the place went ape shit. The, all of the, the, you know, all of the, the the affiliates. And we realized at that exact moment that we were going to have a show that we, because we knew the time slot was great. It'd been there'd only been two shows in sixteen years in that time slot. Wow! But we knew suddenly, as a bunch of actors who, you know struggled quite honestly we were all sort of fighting for careers and suddenly it was like oh we're going to be working for a while mm -hmm. and the joy that came with that i think you know you, you, i mean people forget when when our show came out and the first season and the first few seasons actually um you know we were doing 10 million more people than friends which was you know a, 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 an hour earlier than us we were just a huge huge television show and we we all recognized it and we had fun because we were like wow this is really crazy and we know how lucky we are and we knew that that wouldn't happen again you <laughs> knew how lucky you were i got terribly spoiled having this first big experience be the most incredible experience you can be in and then the rest of your career is comparing everything to this <laughs> once in a lifetime opportunity. You were 23. Constant <laughs> professionals and you're working with tremendous writing and tremendous directors and everybody's watching. And then you're like, that, that's not always the case. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. That's absolutely yeah, true. I, I remember when, um, because I didn't understand ratings. I didn't know what that meant. And I think our first show, right, we, we got a 44 million Right, that was the the oh, number, which was big. the whole numbers, and then when I went on to do <laughs> the Good Wife, they said we're a hit. We have fourteen million, and I was like, 
That's not a hit. Forty-four millions ahead, but everything has changed since then. It's just yeah. Not yeah. the same. And also, we didn't, we weren't competing against HBO but cable. There was no streaming. So well, right, were we? Yeah, I mean, but think about it. You know, the, the shows that we were being compared to. If you remember, you guys remember, we would get these ratings. They would send them <laughs> to us, and they'd say. You know, you're you've tied with Charlie's Angels. Remember that? That was the big oh, you tied Charlie's Angels. But the truth was, the shows that we were tying were when there were three networks, and there were, you know, there were a hundred and some channels by the time we got on the air. So there was, you know, it was different. It was a real sort of appointment television, and we were, look, we I, I'd been on seven series before that, and not one of them was a success, and. Uh, it, it, we all got to take a really nice ride on a really wonderful show, I think. And uh, yeah. and and I got to work with the you know the this group. I mean, I remember our, my first days with with uh, CCH Pounder was like you know I I looked over and I was like, this is an actress that I adore, and I hope I don't screw up the scene. You know, it was just so much fun all the way around. Well, George, uh, CCH put you in your place quite well. Oh. Angela Hicks. Hey, hi. I'm Dr. Ross. <laughs> Listen, why don't you take a uh, bedpan detail here? It's not very glamorous, but very necessary. That's Dr. Hicks. I'm the new attending ER physician. Oops. <laughs> you won't be needing these then. Yep. <laughs> Who is that young, gorgeous woman? Who is she? Who is she? <laughs> you know what people never talk about is that we went from Dr. Kildare to ER. Yeah. You know, let's fix the heart muscle right here, Dr. Yeah. Kildare. Do you remember? You remember we talked about it. We would say all of the doctors, when all the doctor shows we watched, he would do eye surgery and heart surgery. Remember? And it was like, that was what shows were. And that was the beauty of this was it was very and, and that and that we took that stigma of uh, uh, the the woman is not the nurse in the scene, which was important right. for us to talk about. You know, I remember um, like I was um, I was hired to do three episodes in the first season initially, uh -huh. and then those three turned into six, and then second season was like. <laughs> Like wow. <laughs> You're hanging on. Like, what? So, that yeah. happened to you too, though, Laura, didn't it? Didn't you come on? And there was yeah. a whole thing about your cane. What was the. <laughs> yeah. She switched canes. <laughs> she switched I arms. Was, I came on in year two. And of course, the show was like white hot. And I was, and so many people were auditioning for it. I thought, well, I'll never get this. So I was n not nervous because I thought this is never no. going to happen. And I, in the callback, Noah, you were in the room because they were I auditioning remember. some love in figures. Anyways, the thing I have to say is that I came onto the set. I was totally, totally nervous. I walked in the set, George and Tony walked toward me and I was like, holy shit, my God. And they immediately knew exactly what to do. They said something funny. They said something irreverent. They said like, don't screw up. They gave me like a hug. And I thought, this, these people are incredible. And that's the thing that I will say, the decency of the people, the work ethic, the energy, the preparation, the fun of the movement. It wasn't mm -hmm. like, and when I went on to work on other shows or direct other shows, it was like, hit your mark, get touch ups. It was like, oh my God, this is so boring. I mean, <laughs> ER was so wonderful and so integrated with the operators and the boom operators and everybody was just doing the dance. And it was unbelievable, unbelievable. But I watched that clip, and I know as many people in the background's name as I do in yeah. the foreground, and that's the big distinction. Is I'm picking out, oh, there's Shuby, and there's Brick, and there's uh -huh. Hervé, and there's Mary. I mean, we were all sequestered on that soundstage together, and there and George, very early on, you remember you called us all into your trailer, and you said, I've had the benefit of being on seven series that haven't gone. Here's what we're going to do differently. We're all going to be nice to everybody, and we're going to erase the lines between foreground and background and cast and crew. We're all going to take our work seriously, but we're not going to take ourselves seriously. We're going to do our homework and we're not going to waste rehearsals with learning our lines. And you kind of laid out, you know, the ABCs of professionalism. And that just became the standard 
that we operated under. And it should be standard operating procedure, but in a way it was something that we kept our own counsel and were harsher on each other as, mm. as castmates than anybody else above us was ever going to be. And we kept each other honest. Well, no, I think it's important you should know now, it's late, but you should know that we'd all met ahead of time and we decided we had to have that conversation with you. Oh, that was an intervention. Oh, now I know that, that was an intervention. Oh. <laughs> Not fair. <laughs> no, you know what? Here's the thing. We were really lucky that everybody, and, and it started at Tony, who was number one on that call sheet and walked on the set and said, you know, um, uh, let's let's enjoy ourselves and let's have fun. Uh, every single actor that came on, you know, was treated with respect. We treated with respect, but they treated us with respect. Uh, the, the John Wells made a beautiful set for us. The directors all did Mimi and uh, everybody did. I just, we were just really lucky. I just, you know, I've been unlucky before and I've been lucky a couple of times and this was lucky, I think. You know, I think I think fear really drove a lot of it in in a healthy <laughs> way because, you know, it was really effing hard. I remember like that pilot going like, I had no idea where that door went, what the thing was. I remember the first day, George, we're like, a thing, we're like, they're giving us like a pig's foot and like, here, yeah. <laughs> pig's foot. you're like, what the... And you like here's a laryngoscope and all this stuff that ultimately became second with and so as a result, like you had to be prepared and it was really that's what was really fun. It's out of like you had to know your words. And it's I mean, to this day, I'm sure all of you, you go on sets now and your people are like you show up and people are like they don't know their words and you're like what are you doing? Like, <laughs> it's not even carboxyhemoglobin. Jesus. Ventricular tachyarrhythmia. Yes, I don't have to worry. I can't worry about dialogue. Tony, yeah. you were really, really good about knowing your medical terminology. Oh, damn. Order uh, 10 units uh, crypto uh, my pseudonymine. <laughs> Yeah, see, it, I have a speech impediment, and I have a <laughs> Yeah, thanks for pointing that out, Seth and James. <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> He's walking. Talk about triggering. We take it back. We take it back. <laughs> We're sorry. There's no one else here. <laughs> so one of the questions we have, re-watching the show, how much were on location? You must have stories of like uh, of being being in Chicago and like were fans watching on the sides? Did you have to close streets? Like what was it like? Snowstorms and drinking in the lobby. I, of the I, I remember the first time I, we shot in Chicago five times a year. We would go to do exteriors in Chicago, and of course most of it's in L.A. And you would run out of the ambulance bay to to get to the ambulance in your scrubs in L.A. and then. Cut to we're in Chicago and it's 40 below and you're in cotton scrubs and clogs and you're so angry at yourself for not putting on that jacket when you could have um, beforehand. But I remember um, thinking, oh my God, their lives have changed. When I walked with, it was Tony and George and Noah and Eric and we were in Chicago and we decided to go and have dinner. Mm -hmm. And it was like walking with the Beatles. It, I think women were throwing their panties at them. It was one of those bizarre, I remember just sort of standing back because the crowds came in and they were screaming, screaming for the guys. And I was like, oh my God, this is crazy. This is like what it must've been like. Well, not for me, no one threw their panties at me, but they, they definitely, yes. <laughs> but it, it must've been what it's like, they were like rock stars, these guys. And also you know? they're all tall, right? Yeah. So they're like these, you know, tall, handsome, walking down. Oh, they're all, I'm five eleven. These guys are all like six. I, I everybody always thought I was like some, you know, tying my shoes up like this. But. <laughs> Easy now. But I love shooting in Chicago. It was a great time yeah. to shoot in. They were so welcoming, and the crews were great. And I mean, it was freezing cold, but I what shot there a lot because Hathaway's house, the exterior of her house, was there. So um, you a whole episode there, though. You shot the first full episode in Chicago with you and McGregor. With that you was and McGregor, that's right. On the yeah. show that we did, and then we spent more and more time there as the show went on, and our investment and in infrastructure grew. But yes. it was a huge part of the texture of the show was getting that weather. But I it honestly, like you said, when I think about Chicago, I think about the bar and the Ritz, and yes. how we go 
kids that every single night sitting there in those comfy chairs with that big fountain going, just in each other's company, just not wanting to say good night or goodbye to each other. Yeah. We, we, we're with each other all the time anyway. Well, you yeah. remember, remember the Tony? Like, the Tony was like hosting uh, Saturday Night Live, and we all got on a plane and flew out <laughs> for the night because we just wanted to be there for him when he did it. And yeah, you know, there was a. I have to say there. You know, and Friends had this too. It, it was a really interesting sort of feeling because Friends and we started at the same time and it started with six of us in, in the very beginning. And there was this, you know, sort of symbiotic relationship and they were really close and, re and continue to be really close friends and stuff. And we were sort of, we and we were, uh, they were on the stage right next to us. And, but there was this feeling we had at the time that, you know, we, first of all, we did really understand that we were lucky. But we also really felt like we couldn't believe it was work. I mean, it was hard. You, you, you know, what people don't understand is our shows were 47 pages in 1993. And our show was 47, 52 pages maybe because it'd be a 44 minute show. We were doing 90, 95 page scripts, right, Laura? I think, wouldn't it be about yeah, that? 80, so, 90, yep. so we're like doubling it up. And, you know, and it's all shot in oneers you know, with the camera moving. So it became, it was a real challenge for all of us and it became a point of pride. We were proud of the fact we would go and watch the show uh, Thursday morning before it aired Thursday night over in John Wells' office. And we were proud of the fact that we weren't milking a scene for emotion, you know, that we would, you know, some kid would die and we'd be like, well, that's too bad and would walk away and you'd get a a tap from Eric LaSalle or you'd, you know, look over at Giuliani, Gi Giuliana and we'd, she'd wink, you know, because we'd go, oh, we didn't, we didn't hand bone it up, which was the, you know, which was the danger of a show like this. So it was great. It was great. It was I'm great. so curious about role models because, you know, Dr. LaPuga is a real doctor and he said he loved your show. Like CCH, would you hear from like young women of color who said like, I thought I could go into the medical field because of you? Would you ever hear from fans like that? I can kind of hear from almost everybody because they saw a black woman and then thought, well, if she can do it and say the words, maybe I can too. Mm -hmm. So a, a lot of people became interested in more like the ER aspect, because I, I think a lot of people, um, when I say it's the kill their effect, it's that friendly doctor, you go and you feel a pulse, and you have a little conversation if that's it. And here you are, you've got gurneys barreling down the, the corridor, things are happening left and right. And it, it's almost sort of cowboy action in the medical field. So it was, and still is, I think, a very exciting show to watch. Mm -hmm. It's also the first of that kind. And that's what was a huge difference. And the fact that you said real words that really existed in the medical field, mm -hmm. and that these were things that we had real doctors who were our coaches and who told us how to say the words where the scaffold goes and whatever other mm -hmm. instrument that you had to use for that scene. So it was, that's why people came in on time and that's why the guys played basketball so quickly. We did 50 I patients, right? Tell me we would do 50 patients an episode yeah. and they used to do three patients an episode. But to your question, Seth, they, uh, yesterday I got my COVID test going back to work and, and the doctor came in and was like, just went off. I mean, here's a, you know, 35, 40 year old doctor who's like, the only reason I'm a doctor is because of ER. And he says, we used to bet on the show. And we was like, you know, and what he said, though, which I think your point is that you guys did everything right. You just did it three times faster than anybody can actually do it. But we did every process we had to do it. And so that's, I mean, the writers trusted in that. And I think from that reality, it's like that thing where people are just like, oh, just fake it. If they're watching that, you know, it's trouble. But the fact is all the good stuff came out of trying to do it for real. Yeah. I would see Noah stitching a pig's foot off camera, just practicing to stitch a pig's foot. Remember that? I do. <laughs> you know, point. I don't think a day goes by where I don't get a message from somebody saying that they were inspired by our show to go into medicine. And and when you look at those numbers on balance, it's got to be the greatest thing I've ever done with my life, especially in 2020, realizing that all those first responders got their sort of inoculation about what it is to be a first responder from our show is extremely gratifying. Wow. And if I can think back one extra thing, because he's not here and I wish he was, but Eric... Yeah. 
you know, when you talk about representation on television, the relationship I'm most proud of on the show was the one that he and I had because he played an unapologetically talented black man who didn't cater to anybody's opinion or didn't care to be liked. And it was a really unpopular character to play and an unpopular stance to take. And I didn't understand it at the time. I don't think a lot of us understood what he was doing at the time. But in retrospect, he was standing for something that was extremely significant. It was on the vanguard of something way ahead of his time. And I wish he was here to take the bow for it because I don't yeah. think he would take it when we worked together. Well, remember when the uh, really TV well Guide wouldn't put an African American on the cover of their magazine and we all boycotted them? Yeah. Well, you <laughs> found that they had more. They had more cartoon characters and animals on the cover. You remember that? And we were like, we pointed it out and they said, you can't tell us, you know, who we can put on the cover. We said, no, we can't tell you to put on the cover, but we can point out what you do and we well, can stop doing it with you. I'll quote you. George wrote a hell of a letter to TV guy that ended with, and I know you don't go running into a crowded theater and yell fire, unless of course there is one. <laughs> <laughs> I think I ripped that off from somebody. Um, well, that's a good point that you make, Noah, though, because even though it wasn't that long ago, you know, this, like, the next generation, the new generation that that is watching the full 15 seasons of ER on Hulu or, you know, they that kind of reminder of what it takes sometimes as an artist to just kind of have a specific perspective and really, you know, honor that. And it's not easy to do, and needless to say, the writing. Every director comes in and wants you to play sentimentality. Every director wants you to be likable in the scene. And Eric would have to fight That's right. every single week and say, I know what I'm doing, I know who I'm playing. And so interesting. Also, people don't understand that on our shows, because they have to do prep and post, you can't have the same director directing like on a sitcom. Mm -hmm. So you'll have a director who comes in who doesn't really know the show or knows it you know, uh, as directed four episodes ago and they come in and, you know, there'll be a kid dying or a woman dying. And they'll go, you know, this really makes you cry. And you go, I cried last week. <laughs> you know, and it became sort of our job as I think these, uh, all these wonderful actors would agree to sort of protect the character because wow. it's not the director's fault. They just didn't see it. And, and of course they'd want you to be, you know, it was, it was a really fascinating time. I think we had that term of if 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 you if there was a moment, walk away from it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Turn your back on it. Fuck out. I mean, always. I mean, I always. always felt that there was a moment where a, a new director kind of wanted to make his show. Yeah. You know, and God love him. You can't blame them because <laughs> it's not as if they're doing it every single day. This is. It's finally. I got to do ER. I'm gonna. And then I'm going to make that woman cry. That one's going to have to <laughs> death. And it's like, no. It's, Except it's Quentin like, Tarantino. Do you remember really, that? Yeah. yeah. When yeah. Quentin Tarantino came to direct us, and he was such a big fan of the show, he only did one take. Yeah. So yeah. they didn't have a choice to edit. Do you remember yeah. that? Wow. Yeah. So we would rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. We'd do one take. He goes, good, let's move on. And I said, why are you doing that? And he goes, It'll be my cut, no matter yeah. what. <laughs> wow. Remember, what was that director's name? Charlie Hayde? You know, oh, yeah, was, the yeller. Yeah, they would yell and you yell. And I remember I was in the uh, in the emergency room itself, and and uh, it, it, and this one poor actress, she was like a you know working as a day player, and she clearly auditioned by crying like crazy. And he comes, he's like, "Okay, we get in here, you go cry." You gonna cry? <laughs> and she's like, uh, uh, okay. And it, it's it's a wonder. So it's like, you know, twelve pages of dialogue, and it lands on her, and it's like she's like <laughs> cry, pulling nose and whatever she could do, and she can't cry. And he kept going, cry, cry. <laughs> and finally, he goes, hell with it, print it, move on. And he walks out, and I'm standing there with her, and she looks at me, and she's just like. And, and, and she goes, I don't know what happened. I couldn't cry. And I was like, I bet you do in the car on the way home. <laughs> <laughs> it was really oh, I feel bad for any guest stars. It, you know, it's a muscle that we all learned after a while, but it's really hard to just come in and do it once. Yeah. Just okay. I think it's really hard. But do you think sometimes the guest star 
<laughs> like I, I remember after a couple of three years of doing something where you do a scene where you've kind of done these scenes before because you know at some point you've kind of you're starting to match it and you're kind of going well okay, I, I know what to do here and you're not really paying attention and there's some actor because it's er who comes in and just knocks it out of the park yeah. and you're looking at me like wow you just wiped the floor with me you just, <laughs> yeah. you just buried me man you just killed me that happened hey, a lot hey, with me I used to say CC. I'm sorry, Tony. CCH is in New Orleans filming, and I and I know you have to go. So we wanted to to thank you so much for coming on. You got it. It was really good to see all of you. And just a quick note to you, Gloria. The whole waterkeepers thing. Congratulations on doing that. And I've also just got hips to my own country that is you know below sea level, like New Orleans. And uh, is having a huge problem with dikes and um, cocas because po folks are polluting the waterways and they're getting clogged with the plastic bottles. So um, thank you for what you're doing. And hopefully during all of this, everybody will make that a loud part of uh, the conversation. Indeed. Thanks, CCH. Thank Thanks for having me in a couple of months. If hopefully if you're still in London. <laughs> Take I'll be here. I got nowhere to go. All right. <laughs> Bye. 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 Okay. Okay. Speaking of guest stars, there's one guest star we have to we have to talk about, and we have the clip. Yes. And and George, it's with there was your, some nepotism happening. We want to know how it happened. But I understand oh. it. So, oh, Rosemary Clooney. Go ahead, how did how did Rosemary Clooney happen? Was the role written for her? Did you pitch her? It's the perfect matching of star and role. How did it happen? <laughs> I had nothing to do with it, literally. I had nothing to do with it. John Wells called me up one day and said, I've got a part for your aunt. And I was like, oh, okay. And then they called her up and asked her to do it. It was completely out of the, I, I didn't have, you know, they would do that to us. They did it to, I think all of us at one point or another, they'd call and say, oh, I want to work with somebody. And so it wasn't, I, I wish I could take credit for it, but uh, I had nothing to do with it. Noah, your scene with her that we're going to show, it's like one of the, there's so many, of course, scenes that you cry that the audience cries in um from er but this one in particular it is so sweet what was yeah. it like having like such a famous singer she wasn't lip syncing that was her voice what was it like hearing the voice coming out of her right next to you well i had the great benefit of getting sort of all the older patients so i got stanford meisner which is a <laughs> oh my god my yes, she did Red Buttons, and I got uh, Eli Wallach, and I got Mickey Rooney. Uh, <laughs> so I had an unbelievable embarrassment of riches with the people I got to work with. But Rosemary was one of the earliest sort of heavy hitter guest stars that we had on the show. And I thought she was just amazing. You know, she played a sort of form of aphasia that's not difficult. It's very hard to play less intelligent than you are or more confused than you are. And she had she had a really interesting quality. And then when she began to sing, the expectation is that she would fall into her old sort of performance rhythm, but she didn't. She found a sort of a vocal yeah. quality that seemed much more pedestrian and less polished than a professional would be, which made it all the more heartbreaking. Yeah. And I, I just thought, you know, she and I kept in touch over the years and she ended up, I moved up to San Inez where her daughter lived and uh, I got to see her perform a few other times. And I just thought she was very, always very kind to me. And I, I really enjoyed the time. But Noah yeah. was the <laughs> nephew she always wanted. <laughs> Obviously. Well, you can see that in this clip. That vaporize and the vapor becomes the dreams we devise. And while we are dreaming, time flies. And while we are dreaming, time flies. <laughs> oh my God, I have to get a tissue. <laughs> <laughs> I miss her. She was she was a fun one in our family, you know. Oh. Gloria, we, we've got um, two of your other cast members here. But before we bring them on, remind everyone why we're here besides this great reunion. Um, I know, after you catch your breath here. <laughs> that was intense. Yeah, that was. Okay, happy Earth Day. And thank you for supporting Waterkeeper Alliance. Global, nonprofit, 
focused only on clean water. So, you know, again, I encourage everyone who's watching to visit watercube.org and of course to donate if you would just and please scroll below. But thanks. That's, that's right, because we've got it. This you've got this amazing matching donation that's up to twenty five thousand yeah, dollars. Exactly. Woo I know, yeah. right? And we will probably, you know, uh, sure, yeah. we'll find out soon whether we will continue through the weekend, and but that number will increase. But literally, every little bit helps. Um, that's right. Yeah. Okay, Seth, you want to bring on? We have Ming Na. Hello. Hi. 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 Hi, everyone. Wow. Everyone looks amazing. Hi. Your lighting wins, by the way. You have the best lighting in the bunch. Thumbs up. <laughs> and we have direct from London. George, I think he's just down the blimey from you. Gorn is here. Oh, <laughs> George, you look crazy. Gorn! Gorn! How are you? Well, someone didn't age. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm like, you know what? I'm like the portrait of Dorian Gray for all of you. <laughs> I get old. You guys look great. Uh, hey, Warren. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. Warren, for Gordon, do you live in London now permanently? Or are you there doing a, a panto? I'm in uh, Cornwall. Yeah, but we moved here last summer. Yeah. So, England. Wow. Cold there. Blood pudding. Nah, it's it, it's okay. I mean, right now it is a little bit cold, but uh, we actually had a pretty mild winter, you know. So the plan was being close to Croatia, travel every second weekend, but uh, didn't Locked happen. <laughs> yeah, we have a question. Of your Instagram account, your Instagram account makes it seem like you are in the most beautiful places in the world always. Well. <laughs> I've been moving around, you know, but this place is really gorgeous. You know, we're on a five mile beach here in Hale down in Cornwall. Wow. So it's, it's, re it's really pretty, you know, but uh, it's photography. <laughs> <laughs> so, when, you know, looking through all these clips and, you know, being 26 year over 26 years ago that ER premiered, Jeez. so much of it's still relevant today. But there were a couple of things <laughs> that we noticed, Laura um that uh this scene that we found and it's like what, what yeah, is it because you're like i want to protect patients privacy but you protect them by literally making it easier to do identity theft let's watch i've created a diagnostic code for the board it's a list of a few hundred easy to remember two letter combinations of our most common patient complaints and we can use the patient's social security numbers to protect their anonymity <laughs> look at these social security numbers up on the board i guess that was better <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Wow. You can't do everything right. <laughs> Laura, did you ever switch your your cane? Did you ever switch it from one arm to the other? One uh, time. That's what I thought. Wait, on a bet or by accident? By accident. Because I was walking down the hall and I was like, Oh shit, because I started doing something with the wrong hand. And I, I can't be. So I didn't tell anyone. I didn't say, let's do another take. I was afraid I'm getting into trouble. So I just like, <laughs> thought, oh well. But, you, know, <laughs> you can comb through 12 years of ER. <laughs> you know, your commitment to that cane and the way that you had, you embodied the physical performance took a toll on you over the course of the season. I remember you telling me you had to do pretty extensive body work just because of the way that you were spending so many hours a day in a sort of difficult body position. Yeah, I have, you know, I had a little bit of stuff and actually the bottom of my spine has a little curve. An oh, ER curve? Oh my God. Oh my God, oh my God really? Yeah. yeah, I mean, it doesn't really bother me, but yeah, they just said, yeah, there's a little like hook there. And I was like, shoot, <laughs> oh well. Yeah. But you know who helped me a lot was John Fong. Oh, oh Dr. Fong. Dr. Fong. He's a wonderful doctor who worked with us who passed, and he's an amazing guy. We lost and he was people. one of the we people lost, who, lost he said, yeah. yeah, he this said, when you're not in the scene, switch arms and just use the other arm so you'll balance. I was like, I never thought of that. Anyways. That oh, so it was his fault for the arm switch. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'll blame him. That's really mean to blame him. Well, <laughs> I'm just saying. I, I have a question, by the way. So, Juliana, you know, everyone says you're only supposed to be on that first episode and then die. What happened? Like, how did you find out I'm coming back? Like, how exciting was that? Who called you and what happened? It just sounds thrilling. 
<laughs> yeah, it was pretty unbelievable. Uh, George called me and said, if you're thinking of taking a job, I'd just come back to New York because um, I died in the pilot. And um, he said, if you're thinking of taking a job, I, I, I urge you not to. I think the next couple of days you might be offered a serious regular role. And I was like, but I, I died. How does that how does that work? Um, and he's like, I don't know, but I think it's going to work. And so I, I was about to go and, and do Homicide, Life on the Street, because yeah. they, I had done two episodes of it before I did the pilot of VR. And they wanted me back. And um, and, he, and I didn't. I didn't take the job. And like a week later, they called and said, we're going to make you a series regular. How did but you know? It was like 13 out of set, whatever it was. Yeah. The first I, was, I, went to the, I went to the test. Um, and they did a, a test of it, and the, and the show tested, you know, extraordinarily well. And the network, NBC, didn't really believe the test. They thought that Warner Brothers had doctored it, and so they brought in a like a, another audience, like a Jay Leno audience or something from, from another, and brought them in right away to try to prove that that, that the show couldn't, because the, the 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 network didn't like the show. They thought it was too dark and too many things were happening and no one would understand the words and they tested they tested it twice in a day and it tested off the charts and they realized because jules character was such a, a important part of it that that there's no way they were going to kill her off you know so that was a it was an interesting day how did you know though not to take homicide i mean i mean why did you think one show would be better than the other um, you know, I have to say, I, I, I didn't know. I, I, I called Tom Fontana, who, who wrote um, Homicide with Barry mm -hmm. Levinson. I called him because I, I, I didn't know what to do. And I needed a job. I was broke. And I said, I don't know what to do because there's this pilot I did, and I think it's an amazing show, and they might keep me on. And he said, if you don't take risks in life, you'll never know. And I'll mm -hmm. always have a place for you here. I mean, he... he he was like my guardian angel. And so between him and George, I I said, okay, I'll wait. I won't eat for a week. No, I wasn't that bad. But um, <laughs> yeah, and then, and and what was amazing is Sherry, I don't know if you guys remember this, but when my character, I, I truly think the only reason my character lived was the way Rod Holcomb shot her coming in on a gurney overdosed. And the way he shot it with the steady cam, and then through everyone's eyes suddenly elevated my character because everyone that you cared about on the show cared about this person. And I think that's really what helped tremendously to keep me there. But, but um, Sherry, she, she states that I have a positive Babinski, which would have meant I was brain dead. Right. She had the chart like up to her face when she said it. So they just looped it and said negative Babinski or something <laughs> like that. So I wasn't brain dead, which I mean, so I have oh, Sherry to thank too. I have everyone to thank, but yeah. Babinski yes. was taking your finger up the middle of their foot, right? Yeah, like you take it up the middle and if the toe moves, you're brain dead. If it curls right? this way, you're- And if it doesn't, you're not. So yeah. Wow. Uh, isn't oh, that wow. amazing? I know. That's a great inside scoop. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Noah, uh, uh, I'm, I'm looking at this. You look like you're staying, like you're the Unabomber where you're staying. What are you doing? <laughs> or a homeland, like I'm, uh, Yeah. I'm house sitting for George and Lake Cuomo, and uh, this place is really weird, man. I like it. <laughs> uh, no, it's my, my office, which has started to look a lot more like Russell Crowe's shack in a beautiful mind. <laughs> 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 I kind of like it. Thank you. I can't see what all those pictures are. I'm so blind. Oh, all my heroes. So we haven't heard anything from Ming. Uh, what's going on? How have you been? You've oh, been hi, George. Oh, hi, everybody. Um, life's been a blessing, and it's been wonderful. And I was, I mean, Gloria, uh, thank you for inviting me to this Uh great party. I, I was so excited to see everybody again. I've seen a few people, but uh, yeah, I mean, knock on wood, you know, being Asian and being a woman of a certain age these days, it's nice to still be working. <laughs> so I mean, um, and, you know, family's good, but uh, I think this was really my first big foray when I came out to LA was this show. So I have such incredible um, memories of 
coming out there and guest starring that first year, not knowing what 40 shares meant at all. That, <laughs> and no idea it was such a huge show. Um, it's just, uh, it's just been the platform that, you know, propelled everything else, I think. But when we talk about, we talk about role models. Would you get letters? I mean, especially with that pregnancy episode with giving up your child for adoption, would you get letters from people who have been given up or were considering um, doing an adoption plan? Yes, yes. It's uh, it's still a very um, memorable and vital episode because I, I was truly pregnant and having to play the part of having given birth before I gave birth to my first child I mean, I remember working with Noah on those scenes and I was just bawling at every take and Noah's like, just just save it, save it for your close up. And I'm like, I can't help it. I just remember saying the scene. Don't really push, don't really push, 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 don't really push, don't really push. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. It was so insane. And then I remember Jonathan Kaplan like wanting me to like really scream and push and scream. And I'm and I was going through that whole like thing of I'm going to just visualize and give birth in the most peaceful, most beautiful way. And then when I had my first child, 33 hours of labor later, I called Jonathan. I'm like, can we reshoot those scenes? I don't think it's screaming enough. <laughs> Do you remember we were doing that? There was a pregnancy scene, a birth scene, and Tony had to, um, uh, Tony was the, the doctor giving birth and it was like Noah and Eric and Juliana and I were standing outside the window and I'd put that remote fart machine oh, underneath God. the actor and you kept going, push. And she would go, Ooh, and, hit, and you hear the sound and you see your Tony's face just freezes. And he tries to keep it together, and you can see us in the window going like this, sort of slowly like falling out of the window. And then he goes, All right, look, you can do this. Push. And just, and finally, it's just his head is down like on our knees, and he just goes, Push. <laughs> That remote control fart machine got a lot of play that season. Yeah. <laughs> oh I remember the alien. Remember, Julia? Alien, how scared we were? Yeah. Who pulled out? I oh, pulled the alien out. out. Did you yeah. Pull, yeah, Tony pulled out this alien, and we all screamed. Yeah. Remember <laughs> Crazy Werner, that you did all the special effects? Yeah. You had it from, like, alien baby. From B. B. I think it was you, Tony. You yeah. pulled the alien out. Yeah, yeah. I pulled yeah. it out. And, oh, oh, Tony, yeah. remember that they would always bring babies because, you know, you'd have triplets. If you're going to have a baby that's, like, you know, a week old, you can only have them on the set for, like, what, like, 30 seconds or something. And they would cover them in strawberry jam. And cream cheese. Strawberry jam, so they look yeah. like they've just been born. Ugh. And we would have this light, this $10,000 lifelike rubber baby that we would rehearse with. And, you know, Noah or Tony or Eric, whoever was doing it at the time, every time the parents are sitting there holding the, their babies on the set, we would do the rehearsal. And we remember we would always drop <laughs> the rubber baby. You had to drop the baby. <laughs> had to you drop, to drop baby. the baby. Just to see their reaction. <laughs> this is before we were parents. Yes. Yes. That's true. This is when we were dicks. <laughs> yeah, well. Well, to bring it down, we have that really beautiful scene between uh, Migna and Noah here. This is it. It's so great. Aww. 18 years from now. He shows up looking for an explanation. Well, you tell him the truth, you know? You tell him that you wanted to provide the best home possible for him. Did I tell him I was a coward? That my bigoted parents were more important to me than he was? Beautiful. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Some heavy shiz. You guys look so, you're so young. <laughs> oh, my God. Good acting is good acting. Yeah. Michaela, Michaela is now 20 years old. What? A baby that was inside my body when we shot that scene. Are you kidding? Oh, oh my God. Yeah. You guys know that Bailey is now 27. Oh, my God. No. That's insane. 27? <laughs> and oh to this God, day, so 
because he was born the January before we did the pilot. To this yeah. day, he'll tell you where all the different uh, craft service was, where all the wheelchairs <laughs> were hidden, and has such incredible memories of all of you making him laugh and caring for him on that set. I mean, he literally grew up there, and he. Oh, how much fun yeah. was he? So anyway, he sends his love to all of you. When oh. Cal and Mia now, Cal and Mia must be. Cal is. Cal yeah. is Get ready, Cal is 30. No. Oh my God. Jesus Christ. No. Oh my God. And Mia, Mia just finished her freshman year of college. Oh my God. <laughs> all right, here's some fun. Uh, in about uh, 10 days, I'll be 60. So fuck off all of you. <laughs> 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 May we all wear it as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Guys, it's crazy. It doesn't feel like 25 years ago. No. It doesn't. No, it was because it was 26. Or 20. <laughs> oh, okay. That's right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Tony with the sass. Hey, Corin, let me ask you something. You know, when we were talking to the cast of Scandal, they were basically saying they didn't know what would happen from one week to the next. I feel you were always on the verge of being murdered or dying. Did you think you were going to be killed? Like, did you know you were going to live through all these horrible things? Um... I don't know, honestly. I mean, I was on such a ride when I came there. I was like, everything was like awesome, you know. It was uh, it was just unbelievable to be there, you know. I just came from Croatia, literally. I was I did some movies, you know, small parts and stuff like that. And suddenly, I had a meeting with these people, John Wells and Lydia Woodward. I never heard of them. And then five days later, they're, my agent is calling like, uh, they would like you on this show, ER. And I'm like, are we talking about the same ER? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I just came there and started working with all these crazy people, Jonathan Kaplan yelling and screaming, giving me the tapes, I need to memorize these words. And I have a dialect coach, I have a doctor giving me like these stitches, go home and you need to learn how to do this. And I'm like, oh man, what the fuck am I doing? Oh, oh am I supposed to say that? Okay. Say that. Uh, Juliana was my coach for all the bad words. <laughs> <laughs> it was a C word that I never heard before. And we've been, um, I was kind of told off not to say that word. It's a very bad word, apparently, in English language. You taught us all the bad words. Uh, <laughs> I have to say, Warren, when I wasn't being threatened by your presence because you're an internationally acclaimed Hamlet theater, theater performer, and you were I'm 16. That was the problem. You came in, and I was. I, it, 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 years later, I, I looked back and thought, you came to a different country and in a different language, held your own on the number one show in the world at the time. If any of us had gone to Croatia and tried to pick up Croatian and <laughs> pulled in to the rhythms of the number one show there, we would have failed miserably. It's such an unbelievable achievement how seamlessly yeah. you fit in and how much extra work you had to do on the side to do so. Uh, if I never said it then, I'll say it now. Deep <laughs> no, no, thank no, it you. was remarkable. Yeah, totally I, mean, I got to witness it pretty, pretty close up and it was remarkable. You just, you never let us see the work. No, but yeah. the ride was so wild that you you really couldn't stop and tell yourself, oh, my God, what's happening to me? You know, right. you were just kind of like, it was so busy that summer came and you're like, oh, my God, you know, this just happened. But at that time, you know, we were all kind of like in and you guys were all really, I mean, I, I always felt really welcome. And I don't know, George, you remember this, but my first day I parked the car in a parking lot and there's this guy that we worked in the same movie but never saw each other. I had a one day of filming in Macedonia on a Peacemaker. Okay. Yeah. You know? And he's on this parking lot and say, hey, you're a new guy. And I'm like, uh, yeah, that's, that, that would be me. Oh, man, you're going to love it. You know, show is great. You're going to have so much fun. This is awesome. Okay, man. You know, goodbye. I'm like, <laughs> oh, me again. Sorry, it's it's a little bit late. My brain is like, but yeah, it was it, it was it was it was amazing. You know, I really felt you know, uh, Tony was so nice calling us you know to this place, and uh, Juliana was very 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 friendly to me. And Noah and I played tons of pool. He would come by for dinner and stuff. You know, so it was it was really you know I I'm I'm so grateful for you know that time spent there, I, I really 
can't find words to explain that to you guys. Seriously. I mean, really the best period of my life, those couple of years, you know. We we yeah. uh we have we, your first appearance and look how sweet and relaxed you are. Exactly. Hi. What's your name? My name is Luca. It's a funny name, isn't it? Um, <laughs> that kid is now 51 years old. He's <laughs> still scabbed up. Hey, before, before I forget, um, Alex, Alex Kingston could not be here, but she sent this amazing video that I want to play right now. Oh, Alex. Hello to my ER family. Um, I'm so sorry that I'm not able to be with you live tonight, but as you can see, it is way past my bedtime. So I just want to say good luck with the Waterkeeper Alliance fundraiser tonight. Access to clean water should be every living being's right. It has been for many millennia, so let's make it happen. Yum. <laughs> oh my God. First of all, that's not water, okay? <laughs> Oh Do you remember God. the first day Alex was on the set, you guys? And, you know, uh, American actors have this funny thing about British actors. The sound, you know, in, if you look back in the 30s and 40s, we even tried to sound British. You know, oh, darling, you know, I'm only doing it for your happiness. Yeah. Yeah. So we're always sort of intimidated somehow by an English accent. And Alex came on the set, and the first day we were working, we were in the emergency room, and she's like, CBC type and cross four units. And we're like, oh, she's good. <laughs> I mean, we were immediately intimidated by Alex when she showed up. Hello. Uh, Laura, I want to keep talking about this whole thing about role models. What about being a very present lesbian on a TV show? I mean, it was really, I was it the first of its kind? I can't imagine any other show that had a main a character that was lesbian. Television? Yeah, well, bisexual or lesbian, however you want to say it. Yeah, it was uh, the first, it was pretty big deal. You know, it was like, a, like you said, a main character on a hit show. And I remember during the summer, they brought me into the office, which they often did to have a little meeting with us to sort of talk about the year. And so, of course, I thought, okay, I'm getting fired. Right. Great fun. I'm so lucky I got to do this. And they said, you know, we're thinking about maybe... And they were just kept like hemming and hawing, and I was like, "What? What?" And we wonder how you would feel if the character was gay. And I was like, "Oh my God, that's amazing!" I would, I mean, I would. It was great, but also I was so happy I wasn't getting fired. So <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was great. I love doing it. I love trying to figure it out. Um, I got lots and lots of letters and. Yeah, you know, it. still to this day, I think it really, that's one of the great things about the show, certainly, with so many aspects of it, certainly what Gloria did on the show. I mean, it I mean, did yeah. change the world. And they used to do a thing on Fridays, they would, I don't know how they did it, but they did some kind of study where they would see the social impact of the show, like how many people called for AIDS tests, how many people called for domestic abuse counseling, oh. and it was incredible. So that's one of the things that's so amazing. You can have this job that's so fun, so wonderful. And literally you're making somebody healthier or happier, you know, by doing also, it. So you, I mean, what Gloria was doing, people forget. Uh, at the time it was, you know, it was 1995, I think, Gloria, when it happened. Or, you know, uh, uh, people were still coming to terms with Magic Johnson. It was still this whole idea that, this is actually a pandemic that is affecting everybody. And people were afraid to touch one another and they were scared of all these other things. It was such a, you know, it was making people a pariah in some way. And you were playing a character that's saying, I'm going to continue to live my life with this. Uh, I was a victim of this in some ways. And I just, I thought that was amazing to watch. And I thought that was on a show that 40 million people might see. I thought that was incredibly important and brave and that was that was before retrovirals i mean it was like yeah, yeah it was a death it was really 
Tony, do you remember going to those hospices? You and I went down there. We would just hold hands through the night. Yeah. It was unbelievable. Yeah. You know, it yeah. was really, it was at that cusp. It was literally at that cusp when medicines mm -hmm. were beginning to give people their lives back. Right? Mm -hmm. So it was, um, I mean, I know this word is used a lot, but it truly, it was groundbreaking in the yeah. way that we broke the barriers on the oh, who gets HIV, how they get it. Mm -hmm. It was a married professional, straight woman, you know, and it was mm -hmm. like, that doesn't, yeah, it does. And you come out so proudly. I, I, I was just going to say, you guys, you know, you know that it was like, it, it was such a mixed blessing because of the huge success of the show was, of course, the blessing. And yet at that time, you know, it was a challenge for what was going on in, in my personal life at the time. And there was no break from it. It was, um, uh, you know, wow. I mean, people would track me, like call me. The, uh, there was no. But the good thing, as Laura mentioned, is that it literally saved lives. I mean, people and still to this day, as the repeats happen, you know, they are thankful and grateful about breaking down the stigma, like eradicating the stigma and the shame and the denial, still prevalent in certain pockets, of course. But Jeannie Boulay was, I mean, she literally, she handled it with such strength and grace and dignity, do you know? Yeah. And, um, she was kind of, if I may say so, she was kind of amazing and definitely um, a, a role that I uh, will be proud of for the rest of my life. And I wanted to make for sure, I make for sure it be, how do I say this? I wasn't going to let her die from it because that wasn't, mm -hmm. HIV didn't have to be like that anymore, no way. And I didn't want that to be the message in the world forever, for all time. So, um, yeah. Well, we love the scene where you, at, at this point, I think it's only Laura and Tony who know that it's you who's HIV positive, and it's the scene where you basically are, you reveal that you're a patient X. Oh, it's so great. The real question here isn't in law and policies, it's do our patients have the right to know? This in no way has any reflection upon my opinion on employee X's work. Is there an actual employee X or are we just talking? We're talking policy here, people. Employee X could be any one of us. Excuse me. Just would everyone stop calling me employee X? I am HIV positive. Yeah, wow. I remember that so well. So powerful. It really gave people courage to be able to do it. And and the other powerful clip we have is is Laura when um, when you when you come out to uh, to Dr. Romano. Um, and, and by the way, Paul McCrane could not. It was a last minute thing. A family thing came up, and he couldn't and he could not make it. And he he emailed and said uh, he, he sent his regrets, and he's hoping that that Gloria Rubin will uh, put together an ER reunion part two, two. <laughs> and that he'll be there for that. Um, but so this is Laura. When you a long list of people who want to be on that. I got calls all day from people that were like, wait a second, where was my invite? I want to be on there. We're going to do a part two. Poor Gloria had to say no after a while because we only had so many uh, boxes. Yeah, we can't. <laughs> all right, so we'll do a part two, Gloria. There you go. Okay. Okay. But this is that famous men's, rooms, uh, men's room scene. Are you giving me an ultimatum, I Karen? swear to God, because Robert, that sounded like I an ultimatum walk to me, and I do not door respond you well to door. ultimatums. You had better choose your battles very carefully. You're the chief of emergency medicine, not the county's lesbian advocate. That's where you're wrong, Robert, because I am both. I am the chief of emergency medicine, and I am a lesbian. And if you pursue this matter any further, I will take it to the county board of supervisors, the ACLU, the press, and anyone else who will listen. So I suggest you choose your battles very carefully. Woo! That's yeah. right. Go, <laughs> Laura. Great scene. That's a great scene. Remember overlapping dialogue? <laughs> exactly. Remember when people talk on top of each other? <laughs> How quickly everything happens, right? I mean, if you did this on TV now, you'd be like seven pages later. You'd be like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. always yeah. went right to it. Yeah. Really Okay, so we, I want to rewatch re all the episodes now. <laughs> Just seeing these little clips is, yeah, uh, that's what's been so me. amazing I'm about so many memories. This mm -hmm. is uh, the pandemic seems to have started uh, a whole resurgence, right? Everyone's watching ER again, 
And it had been years since I had been called North Hathaway when I, you know, and now it's like uh, young kids are watching it. And I actually asked a couple of kids, I said, does it bother you that there's no cell phones or, you know, does it feel like it's technologically behind? And they go, we don't even notice. Wow. Because wow. it's so fast and they're so, and the, it's so good. So, yeah. yeah. You remember no our, to... our, our first season, Steven Spielberg gave us all <laughs> cell phones. At, the gift that which, keeps at, at the time, we called it the gift that keeps on taking because it was like four dollars a minute. And we're like, <laughs> didn't we didn't tell us that we had to pay the phone bill. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> Steven Spielberg had given the cast of Always, the movie he just directed, Mazda Miatas. He yeah, exactly. Hunter, right, right. <laughs> all brand new Mazda Miatas, and it was Christmas time. And he gave us all these cell phones. He <laughs> said to me, hey, we should write a really funny thank you note that says, Dear Stephen, thanks for the Miata, crossed out, cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that'll be funny. Uh, and then George didn't send his. <laughs> well, not stupid. I'm the biggest ingrate in the world to Steven Spielberg. And I just didn't say I was put up to it. Uh. Okay, uh, Juliana, to, to kind of uh, prove your point about ER being ahead of its time, we have the scene where it, there's a patient who has a numb, a numb chin, chin, and you do not know, you're, you're shocked. You're using like the intranet you yes. know, to figure out it's what It's a it new is. system that just came to the hospital, and uh, it's between you and Tony. Uh, uh, I've got this kid in the clinic who's complaining of a numb chin. What should I do? Why don't you try numb chin? Numb chin. Sounds a little too, uh, you know, easy. Hey. Wow. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's Ask Jeeves. Anybody? <laughs> exactly. Wow. Okay, so there's the, the uh, most obvious question that so many fans have been asking. Would you guys ever consider doing an ER reboot or a two hour special. Here's my performance. <laughs> <laughs> you can come back like the on Grey's Anatomy, like in a dream sequence. It's all a dream, Tony. It's all you know, in a white suit. You know, I don't know. The, the, the hardest part is that when you look at the show, you know, and consistently over, you know, so many years, it would be hard to say that you could do it at, at the level that we did it. Um, you know, it, uh, I'm not sure that that's available um, because boy, I, you know, you watch, I, I've been, I actually, Julian, I've been actually watching it a little bit because my wife's watching it, which is very odd. Huh. And I have to say, you know, it's such great television it's and it's so, so um, you know, I, I just, Tony, I just watched Love's Labor Loss Ugh. and I have to um, say, you know, I'm barely in it, so I can say it sort of objectively. It's as good a piece of television as I've ever seen. And what you guys did, and Tony, what you do in those scenes, mm. I was like, this is better than anything I see in film or anywhere. This is stunning. It's stunning mm. work. And, you know, and I felt that way about a lot of the episodes I saw. I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure you can, you know, it's hard to catch lightning again, you know. I don't know. Maybe other people have a different opinion. You can try. Yeah, does anyone else? Classy of John not to franchise it and not to do ER New York or ER LA, <laughs> which was planned at the time. You know, CSI and Law and & Order and all those shows that were on around the same time, they all figured out how they could brand themselves and replicate the model in a different city and get a different show out of it. And I always thought it was really classy that we never tried to do that, that we just sort of Although, Noah, let me just say, ER Ibiza. <laughs> exactly. That's ER a, Florence sounds pretty good. I don't know. I, I, don't, I, I, I don't think you can reboot it. You, I think it's what George said. You can't capture lightning in a bottle twice, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I think you have to leave what was so beautiful and move on. Um, because it just feels cheap. It feels like it's it would cheapen it, right? For me, don't say right. not that we're not no. over the Friends reunion that's coming up. Good for that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually think sitcoms are easier to sort of bring back than our shows in a way. I, I feel like you know they were so, so character driven in a way. It's very different. 
I did have an idea about Jeannie Boulet 20 years later, though. Where, where would she be? In New York. Her viral load is zero. She's divorced. Her son is in college. He's struggling with mental health issues. Cool. She's still Are in you? the ER, but now I know. I have it like a little bit. Of, anyway. So maybe it's <laughs> about sure. Jeannie and others will make guest star appearances. How about that? It's a possibility. <laughs> Done. Lauren, Laura, Laura, you directed. Yes. There you go, Laura. In the house, yes. Exactly. Okay. I don't know. Right. It's hard to it's hard to conceive of a way because people ask this all the time, and it's it's hard to conceive of a way that it could live right now correctly. Like it would have to be different in just the right way. I mean, it would have to be so so good, and so I I just don't know how you could crack it exactly. You know, to make it match that in any way, it would be tough. The tempting aspect would be that ER came on the air in 1994. Yeah. Right. Right when Bill Clinton had been elected president and was going to revamp the entire healthcare industry, and he appointed Hillary Clinton to do it. And suddenly that became the lightning rod topic. And we were the show that when we were on Newsweek magazine's cover, the, the violence said a healthcare program that really works because we were in the national conversation about what healthcare in America was at that moment. Mm. Similarly, we're in that same conversation now as they're looking at all these metrics about who COVID affected more than anybody else. We realize that we have a huge two party system in our healthcare industry. There is a Jeremiah show to talk about the discrepancy with the passion of a John Wells behind it. That would be an interesting show to see. Mm -hmm. Noah, before we before we close this segment, we have a great I, clip I have to show to this clip because it's it's between uh, Tony and Juliana just to to make your point about talking so much, especially in those early episodes. The zeitgeist. Yeah, it was such in the zeitgeist. Here, our insurance company wants her transferred to Midway for orthopedic admission. I can't apply a plaster splint without moving the ankle. It's going to hurt like hell. We'll medicate her. Do her parents know about this? I'm going to tell them now. Mark, we're going to splint an unstable ankle fracture. Send a 12 year old girl across town for an operation we can do upstairs. Look, I don't like this any more than you do, but that's what her insurance wants done. I thought you were the doctor. I am the doctor. But if I admit her here, her very nice parents are going to get slapped with a surgical bill for tens of thousands of dollars. I quit. What? <laughs> I want those sideburns back. <laughs> Never. I, I, I would have to say that I would love to do a reboot only to be able to hang out with this group yeah. of people, the yeah. talent. You know, as you get older, the the appreciation level and just the awareness is so much greater. And and this, just such great fortune to, I would love to have been, you know, even now, just like, just, just even this, yeah. surrounded by these people. So, I do have to say, Gloria, when we, when I got the call, they said, we're, we're gonna do some sort of an, ER reunion where everybody gets to talk. You know, I think everybody who's in these squares sort of felt the same way, which was, you know, we were really excited to see each other. You yeah. know, I'm, I'm excited to see this gang. They're, these are people that I really love, you know, and, and that we grew up together, really grew up together and in, in many ways. And it's fun to see you guys. You know? Yeah. yeah. George, I'll never forget you chaperoning me on the tonight show because i was a nervous wreck and i was going to pee in my pants and i didn't want to go out there my publicist came and knocked on your door and you stayed instead of leaving you stayed yeah. on that stage with me and that's the kind of yeah, you amazing were, people it makes but me you know you were i mean because i look it, because two years earlier i was a nervous wreck doing mm -hmm. it and, you know i mean that was the thing. We all got to experience this together. I mean, we all got to take this ride where we go, you know, I, we went from, you know, Tony bit had some success in film, um, but the rest of us hadn't had much. And suddenly, you know, we were on the cover of Newsweek about three weeks after the show, you know, from here. And it was like, we went from zero to a hundred. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, you know, suddenly we're working in New York and we all knew, people knew our names. Remember that time? 
and George, we have to say, which you're you're very humble about this, but you had such a clear vision of how you thought television could be for actors on it. And your like Mina said, your way of talking I only end up on Saturday Night Live because you made that happen. You like suggested me for that. You know, I mean you you were gracious and 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 you were like knowing that as long as we stay classy and happy, mm. we win. And we did that, you know, and and you you really knew yeah. that your experience of, of what it's like to be in a show and work with people for months and months and how that can go south. You, you go would south. never let that happen. And you know, we we owe a great deal of gratitude to you for that. Well, I, I, I just feel like I you know, I've just felt so lucky that for you know, I'd been on series that were really miserable. Mm -hmm. You know, I did the first season of ER of, of Roseanne. <laughs> You know, and oh my God, you know, there was some crazy <laughs> shit that went on there as we talked about over the years. And so to, to be in a place where everyone just, you know, we were just locked arms. Mm. And, you know, and, and Tony, we talked about this and no, all of us, we've had these long conversations about the idea that, you know, the only way this is going to survive is if we just insulate ourselves and protect ourselves. Mm. You know, we were working, people don't understand, we were working 17 hour days. This wasn't like some easy gig. So we weren't really experienced. We were going out and hanging out and getting, you know, we were working. And so all of a sudden you would, we, we'd go to Chicago to shoot and the world would explode and we'd be in, in shock. Hmm. And we, we, we were isolated with each other. We were hunkered down with each other and it made us a really tight knit group, you know, all of us. And I think we were really protective of one another over the years. You know, you know, George, you talk about all these pilots you did before. Didn't you do one where you were like in a rock band and you were a bass player? And a yes, I did. I'm shocked that didn't go. Uh, <laughs> I played, a, I played, I, I played a, a, a police officer during the day and a rock star at night. Well, <laughs> I think does. This is the yeah. one that you told me that you're, you're actually interested in doing a reboot of it. I What's the matter? It's no good. You said it all right to me. Yeah, well, all right, just didn't want to cut it. Okay, here we go again, the new Rockney story. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> now, here's the best part of this. I got that pilot on like a Tuesday. <laughs> and on Thursday, I'm sure I've never played a guitar in my life. Really? And I have to let you go. <laughs> I got the job because I had long hair. I was wondering what that was. I, oh, I can't God. believe we've never seen that before. Oh, you haven't? Oh, I'll send you some clips. Well, I want to put that on a loop. <laughs> By the way, that's not even my worst. <laughs> I'm in Return of the Killer Tomatoes, man. <laughs> All right, so we're going to uh, clean the slate here. And Gloria's going to has this amazing video. She's going to talk a little bit about Waterkeeper. I think some of you might be joining us for the last section, which is nurses dedicated to nurses. Um, and if you're not staying, then uh, hopefully we'll see you at ER part two. That's right. Hopefully we'll see you at ER part two. So uh, George, we'll see you in a little bit. Juliana, hold on, let's see. Laura, Laura Noah, Tony, Tony, Tony Mina, Mina, and, and Goran can go to sleep now. Um, so Gloria, do you have any updates? Because I know we've been getting texts, and I haven't really looked oh, at my phone. I, I haven't either. Um, I don't know. Um, Give it to the kids. Uh, bah, bah, bah. I know that we're at Gorn or Mignon, so give it thirty thousand dollars now, but I don't know. I don't have oh. any specific numbers. I'm so sorry. I've got it. I thought that I would get an update. Um, okay. Well, th they're watching, so I'm sure we'll get one. But we have maybe while this video, because you wanted to yes. um, show. Can you set up the video and we'll show it before we bring on Great. the nurses? Thank you for that. Sorry, I just totally was no, not of course. prepared to for this. Oh, but for sure, yeah. the video. So. For World Water Day, this is a, an idea that um, I put out to our 350 water keepers and we, uh, for, for everybody to do an individual video at their watershed, just who they uh -huh. are, where they are, why they love their watershed, etc. 
So out of 300, and this is the first time that this has been requested of them, we received 50 videos out of 350, which is pretty darn good considering that it was the first time and from all over the globe, right? So we put together um, a, a video, two and a half minute video uh, for World Water Day that has a combination of many, many of these videos. And also just FYI, because every day is World Water Day for water keepers around the world. Every week we are um, on social media, we're plugging, we're, we're posting each individual video at length so that everybody can see exactly, you know, everybody's story and again, where they are, why they are a clean water warrior, what they're doing for the watershed. It's kind of amazing. So I hope that everybody, you know, enjoys the video and definitely please remember to donate and I'll be sure to get back to everybody with some numbers. All right, here's the video. Water is life. It sustains us both physically, through drinking, cleansing, and other critical functions, and emotionally, by healing and replenishing our spirits. This World Water Day. Happy World Water Day, everyone. Happy World Water Day. Feliz Día del Agua. We must take a stand and defend our right to clean water before it's too late. Waterkeeper Alliance is a global movement of clean water warriors whose dedication, commitment, and enthusiasm for the future deeply inspire me. But what inspires them? I want my children to also enjoy a clean and healthy river in their future. And the opportunity to make them incredible environments for us and for nature. I also cannot stand seeing a fellow human not having access to drinkable water. Waterkeeper model gave me a mechanism to make a difference. When I hear stories from our water keepers around the world about the growth, success, and effectiveness they have had and continue to have, I am completely enamored because the passion of these advocates is palpable. Feeling love every single day with my waterways and my river. It's a beautiful green ribbon in an otherwise dry landscape. The coming years will be critical in the fight for clean water as we rapidly approach the point of no return due to climate change, rampant pollution, and other man-made factors, we must take steps to reverse the trend and stop this global water crisis before it's too late. Having been involved with Waterkeeper Alliance since 2007, I have seen the incredible progress that can be made when friends like you stand alongside us. We're the voice of these rivers. We're clean water warriors, and you can be too though we cannot physically be on the front lines together. You are there with us in spirit, fighting with us for the future of our planet, for the world's great water sources, and for the communities surrounding them. I'm proud. I'm incredibly humbled. To be a clean water warrior. Clean water warrior. Well, what's more important than water? Happy World Water Day, clean water warriors. Yes. You see what I mean? Yeah. You see it's, what we're doing here? It's so great. It's just worldwide. It's this thing that unifies all of us. It's really wonderful. Exactly. And you know what else is wonderful? Okay, so I just got numbers. We are up to forty thousand dollars. And just for just from this evening, exactly. And Waterkeeper Alliance will match up to one hundred thousand dollars through this Sunday. So keep it coming, man. We are just like, thank you, you guys. This is just Wow, I it's, just... it's so important. I, and I, and for everyone who's watching this, because I know there were comments I saw even before the show, they were like, can we watch this after it's live? The answer is yes. Yeah, and tell Absolutely. all your friends. You subscribe to Stars in the House. Yeah, please uh, subscribe to Stars in the House, we, everyone that's we watching right now. all of our past shows on there, and, and ER will be the top one yeah. um, to watch. So... We've got we've got some people who stayed. I think I we've think, got new people. I think George might have gone to sleep. Oh. Um, <laughs> well, let's bring back. Let's bring back our regular well, let's cast. Let's bring let's bring back uh, the the uh, the people who were here earlier, and then we're going to bring on some um, some more Great. folks. Thanks, Sorry, yeah. Seth, you want to bring them on? We have Juliana. Yay, she stayed. Uh, Yay. We have Dr. Dr. Laura. <laughs> okay. We have the Unabomber, Noah Wiley. Oh. 
<laughs> Seth. That's what George said, not me. I'm just quoting. We have the fabulous Anthony Edwards. That's fabulous. <laughs> we have Ming Na. We have Goran in London, who can stay up later than George Clooney. I'm very impressed. <laughs> more coffee. Uh, I think George, so George just emailed me. He said he got cut off and that was such a weird way to end. Oh, I thought so too. Tell him because, that we were supposed to stay on. Tell him to sign the hell back on and we'll bring it back on. We can fit him on screen. Yeah, so to David to right go off and George Yeah, tell on. George to come back. There's a... oh, he probably went to sleep. Hold on. I'll, yeah. I'll do it quickly. <laughs> oh, but you know what though? Here's the problem though, Seth, is that One, we can two, only three, four, fit five, literally five, 10 five, people on the screen. So, so I shouldn't tell him to come back on. Well, um, no, I mean, it's... Uh, He's staying we'll up. We'll see late. him appear in, in the. So, you know we'll what? Uh, um, um, Ming Na and Gorin, do you mind? Uh, I hate to say goodbye to you this way, but let's let's no. ask. No, you know what? I can, I can go to to uh, get somebody else on. For okay. Sure. Yeah. I'll, I'll just watch I'll just watch it on the Sorry. YouTube thing. All right. Okay. Ming, you and I need to have dinner soon. Gorin, you and I need to play pool soon. I miss you terribly. Yeah. Right, come back yeah. to Los Angeles. I'll give you a call. How about that? Please hey, do. Okay. You're in New York. I just wanted to say it was so awesome to see you. Okay. Yeah. So awesome before you leave, everyone. I want to show Goran. Here, this is you, Goran, in your uh, in your serious mode on the show. Oh. Here goes Gallant. Okay. I'm sorry. Try it one more time. Action. Johanna, we are taking your boyfriend up to. <laughs> 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 <Good> lunch. <laughs> that will be a cut. Hey, it's going up in Portland. All right, okay, here we go. And sit. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of that going on. You remember going in front of the elevator? That was, like, was lasting for about 30 minutes. It was very embarrassing. <laughs> anyway. All right, Goran, go to sleep. We'll Thank you guys. Have a good night. Bye, Goran. I let him know that if he wanted to come back on, he should. But if he went to sleep, we'd understand. There you go. Oh, okay, perfect. I, he was okay. like, what happened? That was such a weird goodbye. I thought it was the lace front wig that threw him with the long hair. <laughs> so, Juliana, three of your fellow nurses are here. So Nurse let's. Power. That's right. Where are my Luke girls? Now. <laughs> Ellen Crawford. Hi, Ellen. <laughs> We've got Connie. Hi, Connie. Oh my God. Hey, y'all. Uh, what's up? And last but not least. Hi. 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 The backbone of ER right there, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, uh, geez. For sure. as well, and she had a, um, an emergency. Yeah. So, but yes. Hello, ladies. Hi. Hey, you guys are beautiful. Wow, Thank so handsome, you. too. Good you all are I, I didn't want to say goodbye to anybody. I was watching. I was having such a wonderful time. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. Oh, my God. There it is. I have, a, I have a question. Was there ever a storyline that you can look back on the show and think, wow, that was really prescient? Cool. Yeah. Let's find the repression because I didn't do all my SATs. Okay. Well, <laughs> that, that was like really foretelling of like what was to come. It was a little uh, bit of a prediction. Like Cassandra. Uh, there mm -hmm. is one particular episode, and and uh, Noah, we have the scene. Is you're you're in it. Oh yeah, it's very kind of COVID. -esque. Let's just say that you hear the words contact tracing. You hear you hear the CDC coming. You hear, go ahead, Noah. You know which episode I'm talking about. Is it the monkeypox one or the benzene? It's, <laughs> it's the one where the where the family brings in the two kids. He was a State Department employee and had been in Africa, and he did not know what the hell We was did an episode about uh, a very little known affliction called monkeypox that required us to go into quarantine and shut down and, and start talking about things like tracings and, and CDC guidelines. And um, yeah, that was a little bit ahead of its time. But it was also a bit in the zeitgeist. You remember movies like Outbreak and Virus were also around at the time. So we were kind of, it wasn't like we were groundbreaking. We were picking up on this new notion that we were all vulnerable to an invisible enemy that we would never be able to detect until it was too late. That was just starting to become in our awareness. Well, I guess maybe I, I, I hear what you're saying, and I think maybe 
this particular clip, you'll see what I mean when I say that, that it could be something that is literally said if ER was around right now with COVID-19. We don't know what it is, hmm. and we don't know how they got it, but it's here, and it needs to be contained. This is not about denying your civil rights. This is about protecting you. If we let you go, you could carry the disease home to your own families. So please, stay here. Help us. And we'll all get through this. Oh my God, I mean, wow. you can say that speech today. Mark, you need to take life. I, uh, wow. I don't remember giving that speech. <laughs> <laughs> the opposition. I have <laughs> Alan, yes? I was just going to say that there were a, a lot of, of, of things like that, either real or sometimes imagined, because I remember on kind of a lighter note, <clears throat> early on in the series, uh, my husband cut his hand, who went to Officer Al Gabarski, actually. And we went to the ER, and we were brand new, and the doctor, the, the right. doctor. Um, yeah, you know what? Someone. Mm -hmm. We're going to be going there. Hold on, we're getting like a radio wave. Yeah, yeah. does someone have something on? I don't know. It's so odd. My transistor radio is on. I don't even have one. It's only my, my it might feelings. Be Connie. It might be Connie. I'm not sure. But anyway, go okay, ahead, Alan. Right. Okay, go. Well, I don't know how much he's heard, but I was taking my, my husband in when he cut his hand, and we took him in the ER. And by the way, I saw what, one of our uh, prop men was an actual paramedic at night. So I said, hello, John. So I saw him come in. But then um, we went back and our show, as I was saying, was brand new. And the doctor uh, that was attending said to him, I haven't been watching that show, but I really need to because I need to prepare for Friday because everybody comes in thinking they have whatever they saw on Thursday. Very <laughs> 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 amazing. Another group that was that uh, were involved in the ethics of the hospital because um, Juliana and I and Connie Marie and uh, I did uh, went to nurses uh, gatherings, uh, conventions, meetings, and um, and there were, was a guy who said every morning on Friday morning we discuss the ethics of our hospital, but first before we get to that. We have to discuss the, sh the all of the issues that were on your show the night before. <laughs> no, we're not going to get to anything else until we do. So, you know, you know, I just I just got an Apple Watch, Laura, and I was thinking, like, did you? This was before Fitbits. Like, did you ever measure how many steps you guys were taking on set? Weren't the nurses just constantly running relentlessly on the show? For sure. You totally oh, broke up. I didn't get that. Uh oh. Oh no, I was asking. Sound. Yeah, why? Why did the sound suddenly get bad? George Clooney sabotaging us? Something <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. He was great when everybody else was on. <laughs> I know. What the hell happened? All right, we'll look. I think if you have some extra things turned on, turn them off. Only have on your one computer, perhaps. You oh, your maybe you're right, Connie. Stuff. Maybe it's the polluter. The polluters are trying to pollute. They're trying to distract. Someone has a radio on for sure, or something. It's not. Yeah, here's something. I think somebody has something extra on. Gloria, thank you so much for including us and and what you're doing. I so appreciate it. Yeah. And Noah, gosh, Julia, all of you guys, and you guys look so wonderful. Laura, I'm happy to see somebody. <laughs> and I I'll tell you, do you guys remember um there was a moment um i think it was our third or fourth season where they decided they wanted hathaway to go to med school and become a doctor yes right. yes and um i took tremendous offense to that because yes. nurses are never represented properly in a hospital and the the backbone and all the nurses I had I had followed around in the real um, a hospital before I before we started the show, uh, they said the doctors fix people, but we heal them. Mm -hmm. And oh. and I never forgot that. And I, I I fought so hard. I said you can't make Hathaway a doctor. You just can't. It's not right. It's not fair to the nurses in this world. You know they've got to be seen. 
And and you guys all stood behind me for that. And we were, it was such a great, um, just a force of nature of these incredible women and these are D, yeah. um, uh, Malik, who passed away. Oh, yes, these are D. Oh, man. Um, but that was, you know, that, that, that was our world. And, and we made that hospital run. And it was a real pleasure to work with all of you, truly. Yes. Juliana, we have that we have that scene Likewise, when you come in. Juliana. We have that scene where you come and you've and you and you tell the women that that you're going to stay a nurse. Hey girl, I didn't expect to see you here. It's a nurses' night out, right? I thought we were was already fitting you for lab coats. Yeah, well, white adds ten pounds. I think I'll stick to pink. You have a second thoughts about med school? No, let's just say I really like what I do. I know the round. Hey. I'll get it. All right. All right. You want to play? Sure. Come right. on, girl. It's a quarter of all. I think I can handle that. <laughs> oh, yeah. God, I don't remember that. I don't remember shooting that scene at all. It's like I had a lobotomy. Oh. I'm going to go and look, look at all the episodes again. <laughs> It's a lot of episodes Great to watch. Up, so. Whereas, Ellen, okay, there was I was watching an episode and there's a one second shot of you dancing. And I'm like, is someone like an amazing dancer? Like, are you an actual dancer? Like, what I've never seen more amazing isolation pelvic wise. What's happening? <laughs> well, actually, our entire almost pretty much our entire nursing crew were uh musical performers, which really came it came in handy when you're dancing around uh, you know. A stretch or a gurney because <laughs> in the beginning especially they just say move around we got more specific direction later but in the beginnings and you'd have the patients lying there going it's like a dance <laughs> but yeah we uh we all of us pretty much uh kind of was a dancer and i know uh lily was a uh, um she was in uh best little whorehouse the film yeah so, yeah, so, yeah we had we had a good time we had well <laughs> well, with the perfect timing of uh, George Clooney, the scene that we're about to show is the last scene of the first season when Juliana is not getting married and George is there and you're dancing at the end and George happens to be here. So like yeah. amazing timing. George, ahead, so. George went to sleep and literally woke up. He got a full night's sleep in the last five minutes. <laughs> was he back? Hey, are you back? <laughs> oh, no. You guys cut me off. <laughs> I've been watching you for like an hour. <laughs> I, think something I, I think you saw me with that guitar and that long hair. <laughs> that was it. Go get him out. Oh, I'm so glad you came back. Good, good, good. Hi, Laura. Hi, Connie. Hi, Ellen. It's so good to see you guys. I've seen Ellen more recently, I think, but it's yes, so good to did. see you guys. We. Great we had such a good time together. It's really good. I miss you guys very much. Here is this beautiful moment between you and Juliana kind of rehooking up. But the most important thing is, Ellen, you're dancing right at the very, very end. The pelvic awareness is amazing. Let's take a gander. <laughs> Oh, that was that was fun. We were at we were at some beautiful church on location somewhere. I don't remember where it was, but we were there for a week, I think. I Actually, that that's when Steven Spielberg gave us those phones. By the way. A lot of our crew and a lot of the people that worked in our office were in the background of that wedding. Yeah. Sort of, sort of, yeah. Sort of, self-referential things where we were seeing a lot of our internal family on TV for the first time that made it extra special. Oh. And Seth and Peach in our bridesmaids costumes. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> what were you gonna scrubs to peach dresses. What were you gonna say, Tony? I was just gonna say, uh, it's so great, Laura and Connie and Ellen to see you guys. Uh, but and it, you were dancers and yeah. you know Part of our rituals, we'd have these tech rehearsals, and the tech rehearsal was basically a dance rehearsal, and every trauma had it, and we'd spend whatever time it took for all this choreography that was every line, everything had to match. It's like we actually matched. Like, you go do TV now, and no one matches anything. It's like, whatever. And But we, like, made it, and the choreography that happened 
and, and what you guys as nurses did. And I feel like I learned more from the trauma nurses that were our advisors than I did from the docs. And yeah. Truly the nurses are the heart and soul of the ER. They really are. Yeah, oh, man. And Laura, you remember, remember all the tricks? Like we all felt like it, it was literally like we were like Doug Hennings. We were like magicians <laughs> because the whole thing was like, you'd have the, you're going to intubate somebody. You've got this big giant tongue depressor that would kill an extra if you had to slam it down the throat. So as the camera's here, you're going like this. And then the minute the camera gets behind your back, you switch it out and you jam a, a half a tube down somebody's oh. It was yeah, just I thought yeah, because I had this trick where I'd hide the short ET tube underneath my sleep. box pane. It's so yeah. it was under my sleeve, and when I'd, I'd yell for the switch, and then I'd take it out of my my wrist, basically, and stick it in the guy's mouth. And I thought to myself the other day, that's so unsanitary. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you want to be in showbiz? But hold on, Everyone, speaking Remember when Sherry Springfield sewed the drape to the guy's head by accident? Yeah. He was so excited to be an extra that he didn't, he, oh, he winced, but he didn't complain. And we tried to take it off of his head afterwards. He sewed it right to his head. Wait, with a needle? You literally sewed it to his head? Yeah, we had all the real stuff, you know, but we were supposed to sort of stop oh after we got through the prosthetic wound. She just kept going and dug into her Do you remember when I blasted myself with the paddles? <laughs> Yes, they were, they were real paddles. They were bad. It was a battery charge no, thing. We thought that they were all <laughs> and, and I went, went, went me. <laughs> and you went down so fast. Oh Knocked me across the room. Oh my god! What an idiot! What's the last thing Redneck says? Hey, watch this. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> that, was, that was me. Wait, George, yeah. George, <laughs> we just watched your rescue episode in the water. What the hell was that like? And were you wearing a wetsuit? And where was it filmed? It looks horrific to film. Well, it was interesting. We were in Chicago. It was one of the weirdest, like, you know, they always say about Chicago weather. We were shooting during the day. Tony, you remember this? We had lunch that day. And it was 70 degrees and sunny and beautiful. And that night, it snowed. Yeah. And we were out in this, this, this uh, uh, you know, this tank. We were out, out in this ditch shooting with helicopters and snow. It was freezing cold. And this kid, the actor, he's like 13 years old. He's like, I don't rehearse. And I was like, well, I'll tell you what, when I'm on your show, we won't rehearse. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to rehearse now. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, That's one line. It's okay. Go on. Oh my God. Yeah, remember I smoked pot in that scene. You almost smoked pot. You finger right. it. You look at it. Target, and then you then decide not to. But holy cow, it's it's very um water world. I mean, take a gander at this. Okay, we we have to wrap it up. We have two things we want to show before before we end. My God, this has been I think our longest show ever. You guys are so incredible for staying, especially the, the late nighters. Um, who is the biggest prankster on the set? I would George. George. Yeah. One guest. George. 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 I knew so I remember that we were working with real we had lube. We had so many so much lube. So much lube. So, so much lube. You know, Why? you went to run to your to the back, you know, your trailer for a 10 minute break and you went open the door and you, you couldn't because there's it would be lubed or I mean Wait, was, let's tell the let's tell a quick no, let's tell the quick uh, uh, Eric LaSalle one because Eric showed up late in the first season because he was doing something in Portland, another series, right? And he showed up and he goes, you know, there's this woman. She's like a stalker. She's chasing me in Portland. Thank God I got away from her. This woman, you know, <laughs> Melanie, she's a nut, you know. And he walks out. He goes, I'm just so glad to be away from her and be in L.A. And he goes out. He leaves. And at this point, we just had these two banger trailers. We don't have phones on them or nobody had cell phones. And, and so we're in his trailer and he leaves to go on the set. And I look at Noah and I said, you understand the mistake he just made? He told you everything. He told you everything. <laughs> I, I, he told us her name. So I called 
FTD and I got a hundred dollar bouquet of flowers sent to his trailer. And we're watching him and he comes out and he opens the door and he sees flowers. He's like, hey, flowers. And inside the card says, you know, I'll see you on the set tomorrow. Love, Melody, you know. And he comes running out and he goes, I got to get a restraining order. I got to get a restraining order. <laughs> and so he goes onto the set and Noah and I are there in the emergency room, like, you know, doing something. And Noah starts to smile, like, mm. and Eric's like, oh, uh, no, 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 I get it. Oh, man, you guys. And I'm like, God damn it. And so I run outside and Family Ties was, remember, Family Ties was shooting next door. And I run over and I grab Family Matters. Family Matters. Nameplate out of his door. <laughs> and I grab it and I switch it for Eric LaSalle's nameplate. And I come running back in. And Eric is like, man, that you guys, you scared the hell out of me, man. And I was like, when did you figure it out? And he's like, well, you know, when I when Noah starts smiling, I go, do you think, you know, do you think Jaleel will be mad? And he's like, what are you talking about? And I go, what are you talking about? And he goes, I'm talking about the flowers. I go, I don't know, flowers. We're talking about sw switching the nameplate on your door. And he goes running out and he sees Jaleel wife on his door. He goes like, I got to get a restraining order. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was fun. Uh, we had I fun. mean, very early on, you don't leave the table first when George is at the table. Even if you have to use the bathroom, you sit there and hold it because the first person that leaves the table, George goes, trouble. hey, you know what we should do. <laughs> <laughs> but by the way, buddy. By it, the end, everybody was doing it, just so we're clear. But don't you remember that we were all having lunch at the commissary and there was that director none of us liked very much. I don't remember his name. And I couldn't believe it. He he did that stupid old thing and he goes, George, smell this. Doesn't it smell funny? And he went like that. And he oh, yeah. and George's head went in and we all were like, Oh, you oh, did not just do that. And Days went by, days go yeah. by. And I'm thinking, what's George gonna do to him? What's George gonna do to him? His last day on the set, he drives off and his license plate says, honk if you love pussy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it was his oh, nice license plate. <laughs> and we all go out and wave goodbye to him. Have a nice trip. And everyone's honking and he's like, huh? <laughs> Oh my God. That was good. You have patience. Uh, like I said, it was all good. about fear. Yeah. <laughs> did anybody you guys hunt? remember when he did that? He like goes, smell this. And I smell it. And he hits me in the face. And I come up, I got like shaving cream in my face. And I look at him. And all of you guys are like, are you <laughs> great? <laughs> you know who you just did that to? <laughs> I was like, okay. Game <laughs> one. Uh, we had okay, so we're before you guys go, everybody did more acting and directing. Gloria, you went this left turn with Tina Turner. Can you just give us two seconds on, you went to an open call? How did you start working with Tina I, um, Turner? Well, here's the thing. People think that I left the ER to go on tour with Tina. The fact is, is that I knew I was leaving you. I didn't know what I was going to do next. I just knew that I wanted to have more music in my life. Then I met Tina backstage at a VH1 Davis concert. And um, like a meet and greet. And I wore a fridge outfit in honor of her, of course. And she said to me, um, oh, you've got such great legs. Can you, I know, I mean, it's insane. But anyway, can you sing and dance? And I said, yes, I can. And she said, well, let me come on tour with me next year. I said, okay, great. And, um, you know, I left and I thought that, that was so cool that she said I should do that. Cut to the next day getting a phone call from her manager. Tina really wants to know if you can sing and dance. So I auditioned for Tina Turner and her manager three months later in her hotel room. I, she, she, she's, she's sitting on the couch with her manager. I sing a song of hers for her. I can't sing it. And I do a dance again. And I left the hotel room with the gig. Wow. Um, yeah. All right. We have, and you, and you sing at the Super Bowl. Yes, I. Yes, we did sing at the Super Bowl, and yeah, and yeah. yeah. The tour was about four months long, U.S. and Canada, and yeah. So, so we have the clip, and the first woman you see in this clip is Gloria. She's on the left of the screen. Go, Seth. Let the sass begin. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
cinema. <laughs> you show right, Michael if you can't my get video old, with the long hair and the stupid guitar, and then you see that. <laughs> <laughs> we should have shown them side by side, I Seth. Know. You guys, that was great. <laughs> Amazing. Glory still got it. All right, um, we're gonna we we um, we wanted to show, like I said at the beginning of the of the program two hours ago, that um, that we you know we've been doing this for the Actors Fund, Stars in the House, since last March, and uh, and they just sent us this amazing video. I haven't seen it yet. That we would be remiss without showing because the Actors Fund. I'm sure there are people who worked on ER, background players, day players, people behind the scenes Stars. who have gone to the Actors Fund in the last year, especially because there's been so much need. So this is an invitation to all of you in the future. George Clooney movies, uh, you know, uh, Juliana, the the Good Wife, any of that. Anyone we want that back. does anything. Because we we vowed that we were going to be doing this show daily until Broadway reopens, and that ain't going to be tomorrow. So um, here is here are our friends, BB Newworth and Ned Benning. Brian Sooks Mitchell and Chandra Wilson from Grey's Anatomy. When COVID-19 shut down our industry, Seth and James went to work. They've made Stars in the House a must-see live streaming show to raise support and awareness for the Actors Fund to help professionals in the performing arts and entertainment community across film, theater, television, music, opera, radio, and dance through programs that address our unique and essential needs. We're helping over 40,000 colleagues from every part of the country. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, the fund has grown our support groups, career guidance, housing resources, financial education, and health insurance counseling. We've also continued our care and support for everyone living at the Actors Fund home. That's our seniors residents in New Jersey and the Palm View in West Hollywood, and the Dorothy Ross Friedman and Shermerhorn residences in New York City. And we have provided millions of dollars in direct financial assistance to our colleagues in need to help them put food on the table, a roof overhead, and medical care. We're doing all of this and more because of people like you and people like Seth and James. To donate, visit starsinthehouse.com. Thank you for supporting A Life in the Arts. Wow, that was so nice. Oh. <laughs> All right, but meanwhile, Gloria, tell, tell everyone again, um, the, the match goes until when for until Waterkeeper? Sunday, until Sunday night. Um, Waterkeeper Alliance will match up to $100,000. And um, we're already up at 45, so yeah. So I'm sure that we'll hit that number before. And, and you know, Seth and James, I really appreciate, I really appreciate you taking this night out for Waterkeeper Alliance and for making this happen. And you know, Actors Fund clearly needed to say our fellow artists um, in front of, behind, and all across the arts world. And it, it, it just. You, what you've done to raise so much money for fellow artists is really extraordinary. And I, again, sincerely appreciate you taking one night out for Waterkeeper Alliance and to have us all be together. It's much appreciated. And, and, and everything is just, I know that this is um, really has brought a lot of smiles and a lot of good feelings to a lot of people and myself included. And I just want to thank Every single one of you, and CCH, and Ming Na, and Gorin, and you guys, I just, I thank you. Thank you for showing up, and thank you for staying, and thank you for supporting. Thank you for being so beautiful, and um, just thank you. So good to see you all. Yeah. I love you guys. I'm happy love. to see you, man. I love yeah. You. This was heartwarming, huh? Yeah. Yeah. So good. All right. Good night, everyone. So nice meeting you all. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. This is for Gloria. <laughs> How's it go, Gloria? I think you're on the. Anyway. <laughs> I don't know the rest of the song. How the hell does it go? Uh, what? what? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> if 
I knew more, I'd play. 